Now, for many years, these two less common views were almost non-existent, but there are some today because of social media and because some people uh, go on social media that are not trained in theology or have no background in theology or have sat under poor teaching. And again, I despise academic snobbery, but let's just be honest. People who have spent their life studying the Bible or people who have gone to an accredited Bible college or seminary and have sat in the classrooms and listened for years on how we interpret the Bible properly, there needs to be some level of respect given to those who have given their lives to study and academics and the interpretation of the Scripture as opposed to those who just got saved yesterday and don't know the Old Testament from the New Testament. And so again, I always despise academic snobbery, but the Bible does say, in the multitude of counselors, it's found in the book of Proverbs, in the multitude of counselors there is wisdom and safety. And the word counselors there from the Old Testament speaks of tenured academic wisdom. In the multitude of counselors there is wisdom and safety. And so don't be one of these Christians who's been to a seminar on Bible prophecy and bought six CDs or, or USBs or listened to ten YouTube videos on a subject and now all of a sudden you try to present yourself as a scholar. Don't be that way. Always be humble enough to recognize godly, tenured counselors that God has used to help you along in these subjects. And so here, if you're taking notes, two weak rapture positions. And I use the word weak, W-E-A-K. They have little to no proper theology to support them, but you're going to hear of them sooner or later. And so I want to, at least as a teacher, make you aware of them. Number one, uh, the partial rapture view. If you're taking notes, the partial rapture view. Uh, what is the partial rapture view? They believe that the rapture will occur before the tribulation. In many ways, they might be uh, like in their understanding. The rapture takes place before the seven-year tribulation period, just like the pre-millennial or the pre-rapture view. But they actually believe that the Lord is only going to rapture spiritually mature Christians. And Christians who are not mature in their faith will be left behind. And so I'm not going to give a lot of attention to it because it is a very weak theological position and it's not my subject. And to be honest with you, it doesn't deserve our time today. But sooner or later, you may hear of a partial rapture view. And in essence, they believe that the rapture takes place before the tribulation, but the Lord will only take those who are ready and mature and the immature uh, will be left behind. Poor interpretation of Bible to try to uh, dig that out. Uh, the second view is called a pre-wrath view. The pre-wrath view of the tribulation. Uh, again, I'm not going to put a lot of time into this because it just cannot be supported in the Scripture, but there are those teaching it. The pre-wrath view, they believe that the rapture will take place, but they believe that it's going to take place in the last half of the tribulation period. Now, if you're a new student of the Bible, uh, as we carefully have taught, and we have multiple videos, if you're really wanting in-depth study, we have uh, a approaching, I don't know, maybe 150 videos on the YouTube channel that are available, so there's a lot of content you can get into this and study much deeper than I'm going to take the time to do today on this. But they believe that the pre-wrath view means that the rapture takes place after the first half of the tribulation. Now remember, the tribulation period is carefully described in the Bible as a seven-year period of time. Uh, Daniel 9.27 is the official beginning day of the tribulation period. And it describes an event where a one-world leader whom the Scripture identifies in other passages as the Antichrist 
and the one world leader who will be in charge of a one world government, who will bring into action a one world monetary system, who will also establish himself as God and bring into this earth a one world religion and will enforce it with a one world military. By the way, that is covered in a teaching entitled The Five Political Agendas of the Last Days, and that's found in Revelation 13. One world leader, the Antichrist, one world government, one world monetary system, one world religion, one world military power to enforce that. Now, for years, people uh, tossed that out and said, that's just too far-fetched for me to believe. Not too many people in the 21st century struggle to believe that that is possible because it's actually on full display in the world right now, though not organized, though not under the dominion of a one world leader. Those five political agendas are literally driving the news on a day-to-day -day basis. So the seven years of tribulation, as we find in Revelation chapter 6 all the way through Revelation chapter 19, the seven-year tribulation is divided into two three-and-a-half-year periods. And after the first three and a half years, the Bible tells us the Antichrist will betray his covenant, that seven-year peace treaty that he drew up. He will betray that and he will violate it and establish himself in the Holy of Holies, erecting a statue of himself and calling himself God. And the Bible tells us that that begins the second half of the tribulation period, oftentimes referred to as the Great Tribulation, now listen carefully. The pre-wrath uh, view believes that the rapture takes place after the Antichrist makes himself as God, but before the final judgments. And that's the only attention I'm going to give to that today. I just wanted you to be aware of them and to have a thumbnail understanding so that if you ever hear anyone mention those two positions, now you'll at least have uh, a resource to go back to. And uh, I may well, with time, uh, I may give an entire brief teaching uh, on each of those for a little more clarity. But with that laid down, let's get right into the three most debated views on the chronology of the rapture. If you're taking notes, the three most debated views on the chronology of the rapture. And I mentioned to you in the very infancy of this teaching that I needed to touch upon something that I think is uh, very needful in the hour in which we live. Because sadly, on social media, many times you see Christians interacting with each other as if they're enemies. And uh, horrible language and, and beyond debate and beyond the rules of graciousness and certainly not Christ-like and slander and, and uh, you know, uh, all kinds of defamation going back and forth. That's not biblical and perhaps is a good indication that you yourself may not even be ready to meet the Lord because to be a Christian, the Bible says, Jesus said, here's how I'll know that you're really my disciple. You continue in my word. Being a Christian means being like Christ. John chapter 3, verse 30, he must increase, I must decrease. And so the more of the carnal you that is on display with your behavior, with your actions, and with your carnal language, that should be evidence to you if you're a true follower of Christ. That's a carnal side of me that needs to be crucified and not tolerated just under the banner of human frailty. John 3.30, Jesus, he must increase, I must decrease. And so the mature believer... Listen, the mature believer must be gracious and respectful even when other Christians disagree with you, especially on secondary matters of interpretation, and never should we be slanderous or involve ourselves in foolish arguments. I mean, Paul wrote that to us. Uh, let me take the time. I believe it's in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Open your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And uh, yeah, 2 Timothy chapter 2, go down to verse 23, and let me read verses 23 through 25. 
The Bible says, again, I say, now this is the Apostle Paul addressing his son in the ministry, Timothy. 2 Timothy 2, verses 23 through 25. Again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. Reading out of the New Living Translation. Listen to it again. Don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. Highlight, must be kind to everyone. That's not easy, but it is in the Bible. Be able to teach and be patient with difficult people. And uh, I'll just be transparent with you. The older I get, uh, sometimes that is not always easy. Uh, sometimes difficult people, and especially if I've been, as I just recently returned from 19 services in 18 days and probably over 10,000 miles of travel and jet lag, and sometimes if I'm honest with you, that human part of me, and again, I make no excuse for it, but it can sometimes be difficult to be patient with difficult people, but the Bible tells us that we should be kind to everyone and patient with difficult people. Verse 25, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. And so that's biblical advice. Those who believe in the pre-tribulation rapture believe that Christ will return for the church in the rapture prior to the tribulation to take believers to heaven. Then immediately after the rapture of the church, and when I say immediately, we don't know if it will be seconds or minutes or hours or days, weeks, uh, possibly months, but in some immediate setting after the rapture, there will be a political process where there will be a one world leader who will come up out of the chaos of all of the apocalyptic things that are beginning to happen on the planet after the rapture. We also believe the premillennial view that the second coming of Christ, and by the way, the rapture is Christ coming for the church, the second coming of Christ ends the tribulation, that is Christ returning with the church, that is the pre-millennial view. Now let me describe for you the mid-tribulation view. And the very uh, terminology gives you a hint as to exactly what the view is. But if you're taking notes, number one, the pre-millennial view. Number two, the mid-tribulation view. And uh, this is a less popular view, but it, it states that the mid-tribulation the church is only going to go through the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. And as we have taught and as the Bible teaches, the tribulation period is exactly seven years to the day. And not by the English calendar, but by the Jewish calendar, 360 days. The tribulation period is exactly seven years, seven times 360. Divide that by two, and you know the exact timing of the midpoint of the tribulation. And the mid-tribulation position believes that the church will go through the first three and a half years of that tribulation period. Now, like the pre-tribulation view, they also believe that the second coming of Christ will end the tribulation period of seven years. And then if you're taking notes, the third most common view is the post-tribulation view. And so if you're taking notes, number one, the pre-tribulation view, the mid-tribulation view, and number three, the post-tribulation view. Now the post-tribulation view, again self-explanatory, teaches that the church and the believers are going to go through the entire seven years of tribulation. They also believe that the second coming is at the end, but uh, there's a little quirk in uh, the theological 
position because they believe in a rapture and in a second coming, but they believe they happen simultaneously. They believe that at the end of the seven years that the rapture takes place and all of the believers, Christ coming for the church takes place, we meet the Lord in the clouds, and then we return with the Lord uh, back to this earth. Uh, some theologians who uh, are not respectful of the quote-unquote scholarship of this view uh, sometimes refute, refer to it as the U-turn theology because they believe that the rapture takes place, we meet the Lord in the air, and then we turn around and come back. One of the main problems with the post-tribulation view is it doesn't leave any space for several events that have to take place in between the rapture and the second coming of Christ. As a matter of fact, from my position, I believe it is the main unwinding of any logical or theological support for that view. There's just no room for several events that have to take place. Uh, events like final judgments and so on. We'll come back to that in later teaching. So let me close with, and if you're taking notes, write down theological problems. Theological problems with the mid-tribulation view and the post-tribulation view. And let me bring this to a close by highlighting what I believe are the main theological and sometimes logical problems when trying to support a mid-tribulation view or a post-tribulation view. Problem number one, no passage on the tribulation in the Bible mentions the church. Major theological problem, number one, for people who try to teach mid-tribulation and post-tribulation. Main problem number one, theologically. There is no mention of the church in any passage on the tribulation. Now again, the tribulation is in the book of Revelation. It's, it's taught in Revelation chapter 6 all the way through chapter 19. Uh, we have a precursor to the tribulation in chapters 4 and 5. But the full tribulation period, we find Revelation chapter 6 all the way through Revelation chapter 19 in all of those chapters, including chapters 4 and 5. Chapter 4, chapter 5, the tribulation in fullness defined in Revelation 6 through Revelation chapter 19. In all of those chapters, there's not one single reference to the church. The last time the church is mentioned in the book of Revelation is in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22. Nineteen times the church is mentioned in Revelation in the first three chapters. Nineteen times. And then Revelation 4 and verse 1 is a verse that defines and gives us the view of the, of the rapture. And then there is not one single reference in the entire book of Revelation from chapter 4 all the way through to the closing words at the end of the book. There's a salutation in the closing of the book of Revelation that mentions the church, but that's after the second coming of Christ. So major problem number one with mid-tribulation view and post-tribulation view, not a single mention of the church. If the church were going through half of the tribulation or all of the tribulation period, you'd think there'd be at least one reference. There's not one mention. God gave not one mention. He didn't offer any advice. He didn't offer any counsel. He didn't offer any preparation. He didn't offer any strategy. Complete silence. Well, the only biblical answer for that is the church is taken before the tribulation period. Phrases such as those in Christ, the body of Christ, or the church nowhere to be found. Uh, now, some people would say, well, what about the saints uh, that are mentioned during the tribulation period? Well, there are people who are saved during the tribulation period. They're called the tribulation saints because the gospel will still be preached during the seven years of tribulation and people will be saved. The book of Revelation says, then I beheld a vast crowd that no man could number from every nation, from every tribe, from every language. Who are these? 
And the Bible tells us these are those who are saved during the tribulation. But the church is already gone. And so when you read about uh, the saints being persecuted and the Antichrist and that one world government uh, attacking and, and, and persecuting Christians in the tribulation, those are the people that are saved during the tribulation because the greatest revival the world has ever seen is going to take place during the tribulation period. Uh, by the way, not only is there not a single reference to the church from Revelation chapter 4 through the end of the tribulation period in chapter 19 until the closing salutation of the book of Revelation, but actually there's not one single reference either in the Old Testament or the New Testament in the tribulation passages that ever mention the church. Major theological problem number two for mid-tribulation view and post-tribulation view is that multiple Bible passages explicitly state that Christians will not go through the tribulation. And they have to really do some theological gymnastics to uh, twist these passages. But major theological problem number two is multiple Bible passages explicitly state that the church is not going to go through the tribulation. Uh, let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Let me take the time just to give you a few, because I know that if you ever have an opportunity to uh, speak to people that hold either of these other views, they're going to say, well, where in the Bible does it say that? That's your opinion. Where in the Bible does it say it? Let me give you a few passages. Revelation chapter 3, and down at verse 10. The Bible says, because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from, highlight the word from, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. This great time of testing is speaking of the tribulation. And what did the Bible say? Speaking to believers, because you, Christians, have obeyed my command, that's Christians, to persevere, I will protect you from, highlight the word from, the Bible didn't say, I will protect you in. It didn't say, I will protect you during. It didn't say, I will protect you through. It said, I will protect you from. One translation says, I will keep you from. But almost every English translation of the Bible uses, translated accurately from the Greek, rendered from, F-R-O-M. I will protect you from the tribulation. Uh, let's go to another. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10. First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. You really couldn't use what Paul used in verbiage here. Say, man, you're really looking forward to the rapture. Jesus coming from heaven, whom God raised from the dead. You're really looking forward to that because you're going to be tortured and persecuted and beheaded. And No. He gives verbiage to let us know that it's an encouraging event. That's why when he described the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4, he said in verse 18, encourage each other with these words. The rapture is not a time of persecution and, and apocalyptic events and torture and, and being beheaded and all kinds of unimaginable atrocities. He said encourage each other knowing that the rapture is going to take place. Revelation 3.10, I will keep you from 1 Thessalonians 1 and 10. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of judgment. Jesus Christ died on the cross not only for the forgiveness of your sins, but the judgment of unrepented sin. And Paul made that clear. As long as we're in 1 Thessalonians, uh, let's go over to the fifth chapter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11, Paul said, For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out His anger on us. That's what the tribulation is. It is the pouring out of God's great wrath upon this world. 
And Paul said, God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. So there's just three, and I can do an entire video on that, and perhaps in the days ahead I will. But there's a major theological problem for the mid-tribulation view and the post-tribulation view. The Bible clearly teaches that Christ rescued us from the trial, the great time of testing, the tribulation period, the wrath of God, the judgment that's coming upon this world. He raptured us, saved us out of that, from it, not in it, not through it, not during it. Another major theological problem with the mid-tribulation view and the post-tribulation view is the imminence of Christ's return. Demands a pre-tribulation rapture. According to the pre-tribulation view, which I espouse, the Bible constantly talks about the eminence of Christ's return. But many passages in the Bible make clear His eminence. 1 Corinthians 1.7, uh, Philippians 3.20, 1 Thessalonians 1.10 that I just read, 1 Timothy 6.14. You can hit pause and rewind and get all of these passages. Titus 2.13, Revelation 22.20, 20, etc. Multiple passages speak about the urgency and the eminence of Christ's return for believers, but there is no eminence in the mid-tribulation view, nor the post-tribulation view. And then one more and we'll pray. Another major theological problem with the mid-tribulation view and the post-tribulation view, uh, primarily with the post-tribulation view, is there's nobody to live in the millennium. And again, the weight of this rests upon the undoing of those who espouse the post-tribulation view. Because if all of the Christians have been raptured and all of the unrepentant have been taken into judgment, then who's alive on the earth during the millennium? When the tribulation ends, there have to be people left on the earth in their natural bodies that live and populate the millennial kingdom, that 1,000-year period. Isaiah clearly mentioned that in the 65th chapter. The 65th chapter of Isaiah speaks uh, verses probably from verse 7 all the way through, uh, probably down through verse 25, that there will be natural bodies in the millennial period that will live and repopulate the earth. Uh, if post-tribulationists really believe that the rapture and the second coming of Christ are both at the end of tribulation, of the tribulation, then how do you explain there's no one left to repopulate the earth during the thousand year millennial time? Because all believers will be in heaven, raptured or resurrected, and all unbelievers are destroyed in judgment and have been cast into hell forever and forever. So how do you explain there's nobody left on earth to repopulate during the millennium, which the teaching on the millennium, and I have an entire series on the millennium, if you want to go deeper with that, but there's nobody left. That's a major theological problem, most especially for those who espouse the post-tribulation. And uh, always remember this as we close this time of teaching. The rapture and the second coming are separate events. The rapture and the second coming, properly taught, properly interpreted, from the scriptures are two separate events. The rapture takes place before the tribulation period. That's Christ coming for the church. Seven years of tribulation ended by the second coming of Christ. That's Christ returning with the church. And we will rule and reign with him forever, entering into the millennium, after the millennium, the eternal kingdom of God. Of his kingdom there shall be no end. Second Peter said that God is going to rebuild and restore a new heaven and a new earth where everyone is right with God. Second Peter chapter 3. And that is what the Bible clearly teaches. And that is the proper reading and rendering of the chronology 
of these positions. And again, I make no bones about it. If you followed our teaching for any amount of time, there's never any wavering on that. I strongly teach and understand the proper interpretation of the Scripture. It teaches what the early church believed, the only view the early church had for 356 years uncontested. The rapture will take place before the tribulation. It is the next major prophetic event. And are you ready to meet the Lord? Because if you're listening to this teaching and you're not sure that you're ready to meet the Lord, there's nothing more important in all of the world than making peace with God. He's coming for those who are in Christ. Are you in Christ? Are you living in victory over sin or is sin living in victory over you? (music) 